All right, now let's go through problem seven. Michael Scott Paper Company. An up-and-coming paper company recently bought a small truck to help deliver paper to local consumers. The new truck has a maximum weight load of 3,200 pounds. It is known that the model for the weight of a bale of paper is normally distributed with a mean of 193 pounds and a standard deviation of 10 pounds. What is the probability that the total weight for a random sample of 16 bales of paper will exceed the maximum load of the truck? Hint. Think about what this would imply about the average weight for a random sample of 16 bales. Okay, so looking through this problem, we know that our weight load cannot exceed 3,200 pounds, and we're going to have 16 bales of paper on this truck. These bales of paper are going to vary from bale to bale. So the hint kind of tells us we should be looking at the average weight for the sample of 16 bales. So if we calculate the sample mean, we have the total weight divided by the number of bales on the truck. We know our total weight can't exceed 3,200 pounds for the 16 bales, so our average weight load has to be under 200 pounds. Now that we've calculated this, we can kind of see where that fits in with our distribution for paper bale weights. The problem is we have the distribution for the individual bales of paper. So we have that x is approximately normal with a mean of 193 and a standard deviation of 10 pounds. But what we want is x bar. So if we look back at our formula card, we have our sampling distribution of x bar given here. Which says if x has a normal distribution, which is what we have with a mean and a standard deviation, then x bar is going to be normally distributed around the same mean with a new standard deviation that takes into account the sample size. So let's head back and create that new distribution. So we know that x bar will be normally distributed as well. We have the same mean, but now our now our standard deviation, excuse me, is 10 divided by the square root of our sample size, which is 16 bales of paper. So if we do that math, we'll have a mean of 193 and a standard deviation of 2.5. So now we've got our sampling distribution for x bar, and we have our specific sample mean of 200, and we want to see where that fits in. What is the probability that our average is 200 pounds or less. So we know we have a normal distribution. We can draw out our bell curve. We know the mean here is 193. And if we used our empirical rule and moved three standard deviations to the tail, we would see about 200.5 out here. And we have our observation of 200 and we want to know when we would exceed this amount so we're looking for the upper tail here. Well we've got a normal distribution so we can calculate our z value. So we've got z is equal to our observed value of 200, the mean of our distribution 193, and the standard deviation of our distribution which is 2.5. If we carry out that math you'll get a value of 2.8 and now from there, we have to find the probability of z being greater than or equal to this value. If we head to the formula card and check out our z table, we can find our value of 2.8. We don't have to add any additional decimal places there. We just pull that first value of 0.9974. But we do have to remember, once again, that this is the area to the left. So when we head back, we have to take the complement of that probability. So we do 1 minus 0 0.9974, and we get our final answer of 0 
For question eight, we have the owner of the company we move it has checked his employee records to find that 70% of all employees have taken the required online safety course. In one brief sentence, explain why it would not be appropriate to construct a 90% confidence interval for the population proportion of all we move it employees who have taken the required online safety course using the value of 0 0.7 as its center. Well, here, the big idea is that we know the value of P. We are given the proportion for all employees. When we create a confidence interval, we're trying to estimate this value. And since we already have it, it wouldn't really make sense to create this interval. And the center of this interval would be the value of our sample proportion instead, not the population proportion. So really what we want to say here is simply that this value, the value of 0 0.7, is our population proportion. So we have no need to create a confidence interval to estimate this value. So really in this problem, as long as you were able to point out that 70% was the population proportion and a confidence interval is used to estimate that, you would do just fine. All right, finally, question nine, how many? A researcher will be conducting 40 independent two-sample t-tests for comparing two population means. Suppose each test will be conducted using a 5% significance level and suppose for each test, there really is no difference in the population means. How many of these 40 independent tests would we expect to result in correctly concluding there is no sufficient evidence for a difference in the two means? So we kind of have to break down this question, see what is the truth and what is our decision. So we say suppose for each test, there really is no difference in the two population means. So here we're saying that the truth is the null hypothesis. We have no difference. Mu1 is equal to mu2. We want to know out of these 40 tests how many we would expect to correctly conclude there is no evidence. So our decision would be to fail to reject H0. This is simply the complement of a type 1 error, because a type 1 error is when H0 is true and we mistakenly reject H0. We remember that the type 1 error is equal to alpha, and we're given that 5% significance level here. So if we want to find the complement of that, all the times that we would correctly fail to reject, we would simply have to take 95% and multiply it by the number of tests we have to get the expected amount of correct decisions. So for this problem, our final answer is simply a value of 38.